praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength, with all of my life, with all of my strength. All my hope is in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you. Lord, in you, it's in you. I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength, with all of my life, with all of my strength. All my hope is in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. In you, it's in you. It's in you. Who's got a blessing today? I do. Okay. I want to thank everybody. Church, a while back I had a, a meltdown, and I'm sorry about that, but we all I have this church so much. And I just want to thank everybody because you are all blessings to me. For coming every Sunday. I really look forward to seeing you all and thank you again. Amen. Anybody else got a blessing? We're blessed to see you guys. Yes? Uh-huh. It's his birthday and he's not here. Oh my goodness. 25. He is a good guy. We love him. Tell him happy birthday for us and we'll sing to him next week. Ha uh-huh. <laughs> you won't be on his good list. You won't be on his good list. Anybody else got a blessing? Yes, Ray. So I found out a couple days ago that my niece was found after a month out in Vegas. Oh, thank you, Lord. She okay? Um, I, all I know is she's okay, but she's with my, my sister and my mom right now. Oh, good. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else got a blessing? Yeah, Dan and Diane are not here today because Dan is in the hospital. Yeah. I'm glad to pray for Dan. Um, she had a stroke. And I'm like 43, so she is the only child, and she's been in the hospital since last Thursday. And now they're thinking about doing some type of surgery to leave the bleeding in the brain or something like that. So she was at work and she said she started getting dizzy, got a terrible headache, started sweating profusely. And um, so she's very concerned. Her name mm-hmm. is Jay? Yes, Jay. Okay. Let's pray. Father, you know both of these two people that are on our hearts and minds. It's, we see so many people throughout our church family and those that we love around us that are going through physical problems, but these two especially come to mind because they're close. We pray, Lord, for Dan. I know he's going through so much down there, and it seems like they're really baffled as to what the root cause of the situation is. And Lord, that's what they need to know. They need to know what exactly started the whole process and how to fix it. And Lord, I know you know the answers, but they need your help to find out what's wrong and how to fix it. In the meantime, Dan tells me he's in good spirits. He sounds good. Um, he's uncomfortable. But you know how to, to give him relief from that. And we ask you to. Diane is worried about him. She's driving back and forth every day. And so she's getting pretty tired. She needs your help there. So I ask you to be with her. Give her the strength she needs. Give her the wisdom to get enough rest. Protect her as she travels. But be with the medical people that are working on Dan and help them to be able to resolve the situation. And then, Lord, for this Jay, 
We don't know him personally, Lord God, but you know what's going on, and you know him, and you know exactly what's going on in his body. You know, you know about the bleeding in the brain. I ask you, God, to give the doctors wisdom in that situation. Help them to know what they need to do. If it's a matter of surgery, give them not only the wisdom, but the skills and all of the, the proper means to do it. Whatever it takes, Lord God, we would ask you to reach into this person's life and do what is best for them. And Lord, for the family. They've got to be worried sick. You know how to touch their hearts and give them peace and comfort. And so we ask you to do that. Lord, for others in our church family that are going through so many things right now, I just ask your comfort, your peace, patience, Lord, because it's hard to wait sometimes. And I just ask you to do that which is the best thing possible in each of those situations, please. In Jesus' name, amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ of solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every hot and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. And his oath is covered, and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to sin before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. You know, the other day, I was doing lunch, and I was listening to the girls all sitting at the table and gabbing their heads off. And a five-year-old says, Did you know what? You cannot get a driver's license till you're 16. And the girls went, Really? I don't think the rest of them even knew what that meant. I go, Well, how old did you think you had to be to get a driver's license? She goes, Six! <laughs> She won't even be able to reach the pedals. Her feet won't reach the floor when she's six. But, you know, it's all in perspective. And I think as Christians, we want it all instantly. We want to, the wisdom and the knowledge to handle stuff and, and to be able to handle every situation and be cool and calm. Is it a learning process? You know, especially when you first come to Jesus, you're just getting to know, you're just getting to hear his voice let alone anything else. So I think sometimes we want it instantly. We don't want to wait. We don't want to learn to get to that point. But I just thought it was, thank you, Lord, that you don't give six-year-olds driver's license. Anybody else got a blessing this morning before we sing? No? None? Wonderful, so wonderful is your unfailing love. Your cross has spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart could fully know. How glorious, how beautiful you are. Beautiful one I love, beautiful one I adore, beautiful one my soul must sing. Beautiful one. So powerful, your glory fills the skies. Your mighty 
works displayed for all to see the beauty of your majesty awakes my heart to sing how marvelous how wonderful you my heart with this love there's nothing on earth is as beautiful as you you opened my eyes to your wonders anew you captured my heart with this love there's nothing on earth is as beautiful as you that we share on Sundays. It's something I hope that you take home and have it in your heart during the week to bless you continuously. Because it's, it, it's a lot of times where I'll just wake up with a song on my heart and it is an encouragement through the day. So um, I hope that happens for you. When the music fades, all is stripped away. And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to a heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the things that made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless worth No one could express How much you deserve Though I and poor all I have is yours every single breath I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself it's not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to a heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. Jesus, this time we have this morning is all about you. And we ask that you would take us into the palm of your hand and meet every need, and comfort those who need comforting, heal those who need healing, and encourage us all to not be so impatient that we want to drive next year. That we can just listen to your voice and grow with you every day, and learn new things, and become more settled in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. It's a dis disadvantage of carrying big purses. I was in there trying to find my glasses because I lately I cannot see without a have blurred vision. But anyway, you know why I'm up here? So let me do this right away. To light this candle in honor of our military. 
and their families and the missionaries as well. There are probably a lot of scriptures in the Bible that you can read that remind you of our military, but it's one that when I read it, I always think about our military. Of course, it could be firemen, it could be policemen, but today we're talking about our military. And it's come from Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you? That's a question. Be strong and courageous. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And I emphasize, your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. Now, in these 50 states, it is, there is a fort in every state. So there are millions of soldiers, and God is with them everywhere they go. And what I love the most is that he's omnipresent. And he's present in all places at the same time. So you don't have to worry about, you know, he's with this person in New York or, or overseas or another country or different states. He's all with them at the same time. That's something that we cannot do. But the one thing that we can do is pray for them all at one time. So this morning we're praying for our soldiers, we're praying for their families, we're praying for our, our missionaries. Um, we pray that Lord would bring them home safe. We pray that Lord would strengthen them while they're there. I pray that if a soldier do not know the Lord, that the Lord would put them next to, set them at the table in the mess hall next to someone else that do know the Lord. Just to, even just to plant a seed. So this morning, we are praying for our soldiers. We are praying for our family, their families. We are praying, Lord, that we be the type of church that would always welcome and be ready to be there for their families that are left behind. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so grateful to you that you are omnipresent, that you're not limited just to being in one place. You're everywhere at the same time. You with every soldier, Lord, and with every family member with every missionary and every missionary family. We ask you to continue to bless them, to strengthen them, Lord, and to give them good health. And we ask all of these prayers in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Hope I could do these announcements, okay? Uh, the seniors are finally having their time every Tuesday here at the church. At 11 o'clock, we have lunch, and we get to play games and share a lot of experiences, talk, and have a good time. And then, on Wednesday at 6.45, we have prayers before our Bible study. And uh, we also have Bible study in the morning on Sunday at 9.30. And we hope that you could join us on either one, Zoom or at the church. The Ascension, Acts 2, 1 through 12, is going to be next week. Okay, calciumcommunitychurch.org is up and running as usual. Uh, check it out. Our videos are up there as soon as they can get done. Um, so that you can enjoy watching it, or people who can't come to church the next Sunday can watch it and see how we did. Uh, today's our potluck dinner. Um, I brought something interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, it's kind of a cross between it's kind of a cross between a shepherd's pie and a meatloaf dinner with pet potatoes and cheese. So it's really interesting. I tasted it. It's pretty good. Um, so yeah, you'll have to stay after and have some potluck with us. Next week, of course, is communion. Uh, and uh, the book borrowing hallway, which we no longer have a corner, I guess it's in the hallway. Um, we have DVDs and we have books and please bring your books back after you've done reading them and bring your DVDs back and we can sanitize them for the next people that like to take them out. And of course, uh, you got to visit our table in the kitchen. We've got so many good things on that table. Um, I'm a glutton for punishment. I sometimes bring something in, but then I always like to take something with me when I go home. So I'm sure everybody can find a treasure on that table back there somehow or bring in something that someone else could use. 
The Watertown Senior Center, I would like to make a correction on this. It is not really, it is 245 State Street, but you can't access the Senior Center at the Marcy Building where we're located. We're located on the Polk Street side, which is in between Morrison Furniture and I think it's Northern Credit Union. You go into the back side and you can see where it says Marcy Building, that's where you enter and you can go up to the second floor on the elevator and you can come to the Senior Center. We have a lot of things going on this month. We have new calendars out for May. So um, I'd like to see you there. It's Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays from nine o'clock until 10 in the morning. We have coffee and we talk to everybody and it's a meet and greet and then after that all our activities begin. So I wish you could all come and join us there. And we have light refreshments, coffee, tea, hot chocolate, and we have peanuts and potato chips and candy and all kinds of things we shouldn't eat. So I'd like to see you there. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you have another? Um, and please bear with me because I'm getting confused myself, so I, I can imagine you being confused. So this coming Saturday, everyone that's in the plays, we're going to have two plays, one on Moses and one on Pharaoh. Um, so we're going to practice this coming Saturday at 5 o'clock, and the next Friday, um, I believe at five. But, you know, it's hard to get everyone together because yeah. some people say, well, I have a, a retirement party to go to, so I'm going to give y'all a different time. Now you're having it here, right? Yes. I know it's, you know, I forget what we discussed. I think we said 3.30, but I'm saying five, so I'm not sure. I'm getting confused myself. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, but we're definitely going to meet on Saturday. Yeah. I know that for a fact, but I will give you, I, I'm thinking it's going to be at five o'clock, but you need to be here so we'll know exactly, you know, um, what's going on and, you know, different things like that, so. Okay, the date is the 11th? Yes. For the yeah. brunch. I'm sorry, you're right. I yeah. that um, we'll be having a wedding brunch on the, on the 11th, the day before Mother's Day, at 10.30, 10.30 to 12. And if you could bring a couple of dish, that would be greatly appreciated. Because I never know how many people are going to come. Mm. It started out with like 11 people years ago, and that's like almost 40. So mm. I'm just... You know, we have a lot of food left over, but I'd rather have more food than less. So please, um, yeah. I'm out to participate with that. Um, usually we have a uh, speaker come in. Um, I had asked Pastor Kathy, and she should have retired pastor, but you never know it. She's always mm -hmm. doing funerals, wedding, and everything. So she'll be able to do it. So we're going to do two plays or two skits um, to take up that time. And I think you're going to really gonna, um, enjoy it. So mm -hmm. please come out and support that. That's good. Okay, Roger, you <laughs> Good morning. Could I have two ushers come forward, please? Thank you. You know, I come up here every Sunday asking for gifts to our Lord, but actually it's gifts to this church. This church has seen good times and bad times in the past, and it, I'm happy to say that we're in better shape now than we were a few months ago. However, we're not out of the woods yet. I mean, but I have something really good to say. You remember that little church down the road that had a for sale sign on it? It's, it's, it's the church again. <laughs> I, I'm so happy to see that. You know, that, that for sale sign is still out there. I don't know what that means. But I have been praying for that because that, that's such a beautiful location. So I'm glad to see it's, they have their services at noon now, but I'm glad to see it back in operation being used as a church. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you to seek your guidance and protection. We do not know what the day has in store for us, but you do. We don't know who we will encounter today, but Lord, you are aware of everything ahead of us today. So we pray that you lead us in all that we do today. Help us to rely on you. No matter what, remind us that you are our rock and our fortress. When circumstances cause us to worry, remind us that you are never, you are ever present in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise God.
Sounds like that microphone's on, so I won't even have to ask. <laughs> Excellent. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Great to see each one of you. Even those I didn't expect to see. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to think if there's anything I need to announce that wasn't already taken care of, but I don't think so. I think we covered everything. So we'll make it quick and easy. Romans, we're going to be in chapter 15, at, toward the end of it, starting in verse 22. So you can be turning there. And then, of course, what I always ask, look around. I know we're missing people today, and you can tell that. So who are we missing? Debbie Nicholas is not with us. I um, talked to her earlier in the week. She's still having a whole lot of pain in her back and knee. And she told me they're going to do a, bo a bone scan. I don't think it's been uh, scheduled yet, but they have asked for a bone scan to find out if that is part of the problem. Um, she also commented that there's been some question about if her hip is involved. So I guess there's a lot going on there. But she did say she would like to be back with us. She's missing us. And... Uh, Look forward to being back here soon. Who else are missing? Katina and kids. Um, Jeannie, I haven't heard from them today, did you? I know that she was having trouble with migraines last week, but I hadn't heard anything in the last couple of days, so I thought most likely they would be here. I'll have to call her. Find out, obviously. Who else do you not see? I hate to say that's another one where I don't really know. Um, I talked to them earlier in the week. Whoops. I probably should not try to write and talk at the same time. My spelling gets weird. <laughs> I'll blame that on age. How about that? Okay. Uh, not this last week. I tried to contact them Sunday because they weren't here, and they had said they thought they would be. Um, didn't get any response, so I'll have to see what I can find out. Now back to Barb and Charlie. I talked to them um, Monday or Tuesday. They said they were doing okay, that she had been sick, but that she expected to be here this week. Um, obviously, they're not, so I'll check with them again. Who else is not here? Some, some of them are obvious. You all know. Kyle. I know why. <laughs> Two in the morning, getting out of work doesn't make it easy to get here for us, unfortunately. But uh, once in a while he can make it. Once in a while he gets out a little bit earlier than that. Uh, let's see. I do not know about Fran. Does anybody else? I did speak to her earlier in the week. must have been about Monday or Tuesday. And at that time, she said that she had been not feeling real well, but she was doing better, so she expected to be here. So I'll check with her, too. Damon and Chrissy are not here, obviously. They are enjoying the beach down in Florida. So... Um, I think they were coming back maybe today or tomorrow. They're going to be headed back. But that, and they did say they were having a good time. <laughs> and he mentioned that it was 85 or something like that. So uh, I told him it wasn't 85 here. 
Let me see, is there anybody else? I feel, obviously, Hashmiel is not here. He is down in, well, I was going to say Fort Polk. That's what I always knew it as, but I think they renamed it to Fort Johnson or something like that. Had to do that. Go ahead. Yeah, they changed the name of it. <laughs> he is down there for training. He's going to be gone, what, a month? Or, yeah. Long stretch, so they're going to need our prayers here. And he does down there, too, obviously. Um, that's everybody I had down. And, yeah, I think that may be it. Good. It's still a whole bunch, but, I mean, <laughs> I'm thankful for all of you being here. Some of you have had some interesting times over the last week. Understood. God is good. That doesn't mean he never gives us trials and temp troubles and temptations and tribulations. We all go through them, unfortunately. But that's a, I say unfortunately, I suppose I shouldn't say it that way. Because we know God always has a purpose in them and that it's going to turn them out good for us. Boy, at the moment we're going through it, it doesn't feel that way. And so we look at it as being troubles and tribulations. Thankfully, God has a purpose. God has us all through those times, even when it feels like things are terrible. He's right there. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Isn't that a great verse? doesn't always feel that way easily. Remember that? All of you probably are familiar with that about walking on the beach and having the vision from God of the footprints on the beach. I love that one. Um, I saw, of course, you all have seen the part that says that where there's only one set of prints, God says, that's where I was carrying you. Well, somebody posted something on, something on the Internet that I saw last week that where it was kind of a play on that. It, says, it has God talking to this guy, telling him, where you see only one set of prints, that's where I was carrying you. And where you see those two furrows in the sand, that's where I was dragging you along. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not going to touch that one. <laughs> But God is always there for us. And he's always got something good is the result of all those things we're going through. Hard to feel while we're in it, but it's always true. And we just rest in that promise. All right, today we're going to be in Romans 15. And we're going to see, come to think of it, where Paul goes through kind of a situation like that. Well, we're not actually going to get to see all of that. Because the part in Romans is just where Paul tells the church of Rome what his plans are. But since we know the rest of the Bible, we know how those plans worked out. <laughs> and they weren't the way he had in mind. God has a funny way of doing that. It often reminds me. Of course, I've sat in on a lot of church business meetings and conference planning and things like that. And it always amazes me that I, it doesn't matter, Christians or not, you see that people make their plans in one of two ways. Either they make their plans and then ask God to bless them, or they ask God first to help them make the plans. You know which one works, right? <laughs> ask first. When we make our plans, um, using our human wisdom, and then ask God to bless them, he may. But it's probably not going to turn out the way we expected. <laughs> it's funny how he does that. Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Let's look at Romans. Turn with me to chapter 15. And I'm going to start... Actually, I'm going to start in verse 20, a little ahead of where it says there, a little before that. Last week we talked about Paul's goal, that he was really kind of his life desire 
was to serve Christ by preaching the gospel where people didn't know about him, where it was new information for them. And he, so he was going to all these places where the word hadn't gone to yet. Well, let's look at verse 20 in chapter 15. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand. Then he goes on to add, For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way to the word by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. He says, I want to come to visit this church at Rome. See, Paul hadn't started that church. This was one that was started by two friends of his, Stella and Aquila, before the emperor at that point ordered all Christians out of Rome. So then that Priscilla and Aquila had to leave, and most of the Christians had to leave. Some of them stayed, but they had to go underground and stay out of sight. Eventually, that emperor was um, removed, <laughs> executed, <laughs> assassinated. We'll use that word. And another emperor revoked that law so Christians could come back. And eventually Aquila and Priscilla did come back too, among others. But by now, the church in Rome is legal again and is prospering. But Paul says, I've never got there. I want to come and visit you guys. Good thought. But look at the rest of his plans as he's made. He's, he's, at this point, he's sitting in Corinth. Um, making his plans for what he's going to do now. And he says, I'm going to come and see you guys along my way, but I've got other things I've got to do too. Look at verse uh, 25. But now I go to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a contribution for the poor saints at Jerusalem. It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. He says, it's a good thing they do want to help out the poor people of Jerusalem. At that time, Jerusalem and the surrounding area was undergoing a famine, and was, they needed a lot of help. So the churches in Asia had put together a big offering for them, and Paul says, I'm going to go get visit those churches, pick up the offering, and take it to Jerusalem and deliver it. But he says it's a good thing that they do want to help them out because he says, verse 27, it hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. In other words, the people of Jerusalem sent out the missionaries that converted all of these folks, including Paul. He says, so yeah, they have a duty to help back out these other Christians. Makes sense. So then, 28, When therefore I have performed this, and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. He says, so this is my plan. I'm going to go from here in Corinth through the churches in Asia, pick up all the offerings they've put together for the people of Jerusalem, take them to Jerusalem. Then I'm going to come out of Jerusalem to visit you in Rome, and then all the way over to Spain. He had quite a tour set up. And um, I, it doesn't ever tell us whether he asked... God, if this was what God wanted him to do or not, you will find theologians that will argue both sides of that one, naturally. 
uh, there are some interesting comments that we'll see about what actually happened. But he, wants to, he finishes off this chapter by saying, Now therefore, I beseech you, the Roman church, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. He's asking them to pray for him, that I may be delivered from those that do not believe in Judea. And that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now, the God of peace be with you all. Amen. It's almost like he's closing his letter right there. You notice there's one more chapter. Because as he's saying, now, that's it, the end, he realizes, oh, I should say thank you to a whole bunch of people and hello to a whole bunch of people. <laughs> so he adds those in. We'll get to that next, well, not next week. Next week we got a special message. But in a couple of weeks, we'll get to it. So this is Paul telling the people there at Rome, I've been for years wanting to come and visit your church. He says, and now this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go from here throughout Asia, pick up all those offerings, take them to Jerusalem, then I'm going to come see you. And then I'm going to go to Rome. Or, I mean, then I'm going to go to Spain. Now, if you have, I don't know if you can picture a map of the Mediterranean world in your mind, but he's at Corinth, which is way over here in Asia. And so he's got to go through the churches in Asia, go all the way over here to Jerusalem, all the way back across to Rome, and then he wants to go on over to Spain, which is the far end of the Mediterranean world. So he's got quite a tour planned. And traveling back then, he didn't get on an airplane and go somewhere. <laughs> uh, most of that trip would be by ship, probably. Otherwise, walking and uh, going the long way around. So... When he makes all these plans, he's got probably at least six months of travel in mind. That's a lot of planning. And as I said, you will find many people who will argue about whether or not this was what God wanted him to do. Because there is no indication that God told him to do these things. And there are several places where God tells him, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be arrested, you're going to be beaten, and you're going to be imprisoned. And Paul tells the people, the, pro the prophets that tell him that God said this, he tells them, I don't care, I'm going. So a lot of theologians and other ministers and preachers love to say, he was out of God's will in this. But you know, God allowed it to happen. And God produced some real tremendous blessings all along the way. So I'm not going to say it's outside God's will. Maybe there was some of his stubbornness involved in there too. I won't argue that. You and I, were good at that. <laughs> but um, however it was done, whether it was at God's direction or at God allowing him to do his own um, stubborn will, and using it for God's purposes, does it matter? It mattered to him at the time, of course, but it doesn't matter to us now. What matters is he accomplished, what was done was accomplished for God. But let's look back at what he's telling these people. Maybe I should elaborate a little more on that, though. I said that the, there were several prophets along the way that told him speaking from the Lord, that if he went to Jerusalem, he was going to be arrested, beaten, and imprisoned. That all happened. Um, he was beaten for preaching the word of God, arrested, imprisoned for two years. And then the only reason he ended up going to Rome, the Jewish 
Um, he was a procurator, technically. He wasn't, he wasn't a Jew. He was the guy who was in charge of Ju the justice system in Israel at the time, under the Roman government. Was ready to pronounce, uh, and to have a trial, and pronounce whether or not Paul was to go free or to be imprisoned or what. And Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen. I have a right to be tried by Caesar, the Roman Empire, uh, Roman Emperor. And the procurator said, you have that right. And so he waited for a ship and a time when the Roman guard had to take a bunch of prisoners to Rome. That's one of the reasons that Paul ended up spending two years in a prison there in Israel. Because he asked to be sent to Rome, he ended up in Rome as a prisoner on trial for preaching the word of God. Now, actually, God made great use of that time. Um, and then he spent two more years in, I, how would you call it? Um, how do they do it now when they'll take a, a prisoner and they'll let him stay at home with a, uh, yeah, there we go, home detention or whatever. He can't go, he can't leave the house, but he's there. Well, they had their own version of that. Um, he was allowed to stay in a private home in Rome, and when we got to Rome. The two years in Israel, he was in a jail cell, <laughs> in a dungeon. But when he got to Rome, he spent two more years there waiting for trial. But there he was allowed to live in a private home but he had a guard chained to him all the time. He couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, they didn't have those bracelets or anything back then, or ankle bracelets. So they just had, had a guard chained to him, and he couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> he could go around the house with the guard. but <laughs> So yeah, he spent really four years in imprisonment in order to get this all accomplished, but it happened. As far as whether or not he went to Spain afterwards, well, we know that he was not executed this time. He was allowed to go free after the four years were all played out. And it's believed that he went to Rome. There are some records that say he was, excuse me, we know he was in Rome. We believe he actually did get to Spain because there are some records there that talk about Paul or Paulus visiting the church, a church back there in Spain. But, again, the way people love to argue, uh, there, some people claim, well, those records are not from the same time period. It's uh, that much later on. I don't know. Do I care? Paul, I know this much because it's in the scriptures. I know this all happened. And I know that Paul lived quite a while after this, and continued preaching and teaching. He never quit. <laughs> you talk about a faithful follower. I love using him and John the Apostle as my examples of faithfulness. John lived to be in his 90s. He's the only disciple that did not die as a martyr. He died of natural causes, but he died after preaching and teaching all that time. Now, he went to jail a whole bunch of times. He went into exile at the prison, um, what do they call it? I guess you'd call it a prison camp, the mines, work, uh, a work camp on the island of Patmos. He was there twice. Once for, I think, four years, and the other time, if I'm right, for six. Um, in exile. All for preaching the word of God along with a lot of other times when he was beaten and uh, whipped. What's that? Hot oil, yeah. Um, I can't imagine that one. But he survived it. <laughs> I would have to say there was probably a miracle right there. But John went through so many things, and yet he kept right on until he was 92 years old. And those two I love as faithful Christians, uh, examples of faithfulness. 
Here's Paul. He says to the church there at Rome, for years I've wanted to come see you guys, but things keep getting in the way. <laughs> you know how that works? <laughs> I love to make plans and then see what God does to them, because he has, sometimes he has a way of throwing things in the way in a hurry. And then I know, well, I better stop and pray about this a little more. It's not the right time or the right place or whatever. Here he says, whenever I make my trip to Spain, I'll come to you. Because I'm going to do it. And he talks about how he's going to, he's sure he's going to enjoy what a wonderful company time they'll have together. Some fellowship, fellowshipping together. But he says, first I've got something I've got to do. I've got to take this offering from all these other churches to the people that really need it over there in Jerusalem. And he does that. But it's after he gets to Jerusalem that we see things go, his plans kind of go awry. Well, God does that to us sometimes. He uh, lets us go our own way for a little while and then he kind of throws things, <laughs> changes our mind on just how things are going to happen. He did that to Paul. It's not so much different that we see in our own lives sometimes, especially if we don't pray about what God wants us to do in the first place. Or even if we pray and we don't really get a clear sense of what God wants. And we decide, well, we'll do it the way I think he wants it. I'm going to pray some more when you get to that point. <laughs> I keep thinking about, in our um, Wednesday night, we've been studying in Genesis, and I think about Abraham and his wife Sarai. Before he had his name changed, he was called Abram, and she was called Sarai. Eventually, Abraham and Sarah, as we most commonly think of them. But ever, right from the very beginning, when Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees and told, go and head out, and I'll tell you when to stop. I love that little command, you know open-ended command. He doesn't tell Abram where he's going. He just says, I want you to leave here. Go that way. doesn't say anything about when do you stop. Where are you going? He doesn't tell him. But the time I was thinking about with Abraham and Sarah that was really on my mind about this with the plan, making plans and not really asking God about it sometimes. God, right from that very beginning, had told Abraham that eventually his descendants were going to rule the whole land of what we now call Israel. That it was all going to be theirs. Of course, at that time, he didn't have any descendants. He didn't have any kids. And to complicate matters a little bit, if you want to say a little, Sarah was barren. She couldn't have kids. Well, they go to the promised land. They wander around in it for years and years. Get become Actually, Abram becomes quite wealthy. And as far as in those days, what would be considered a very wealthy man because they... Their wealth was based on livestock. And he had huge herds and flocks and such. And lots of servants. Um, I don't know how many servants he had. I know that at one point it tells us when his nephew Lot was in trouble that Abraham took 300 of his servants that were trained for warfare and went out and helped him. So obviously he had a lot of servants. No kids. Now he gets to be 75 plus years old, past the time of bearing. Um, at least his wife is past menopause. And of course, she's never been able to have kids anyway. And God comes to him and tells him, I'm going to give you a child. Abraham basically says, thank you, Lord. And goes back and tells his wife, and Sarah comes up with a plan. Sarah says, 
you know, I can't have children. I have this servant girl, Hagar, a pretty young uh, Ishmaelite, I think. And he said, she says, why don't you go into her and have a child that we'll consider ours? I said, Abraham agreed. I'm not trying to imagine his reasoning on that one. I'd have to think about it a little. But for whatever reason, he agreed. A lot of people like to say that he was probably thinking, well, this is how we're going to help God out to keep his promise. I don't know if that was in his mind or not, but seems that Sarah felt God hasn't given me a child and there's no way I can have a child now, so maybe this is a shortcut, detour, whatever. Well, Abraham, he goes ahead. Uh, Lot has sex with Hagar. She gets to be pregnant. And now Sarah gets mad. <laughs> she says... Her servant girl now is looking down on her because she can give you a child and I can't. She says, it's all your fault, Abraham. <laughs> I always like that part. I think, uh, you, isn't it so much a part of human nature? It's somebody else's fault, always. Well... I guess Abraham still thought along the lines of, well, this is my son. This is going to be the one that God works through. Just when God appears to him again and says, I'm going to give you a son, Abraham says, well, why don't you just bless Ishmael? Wrong. <laughs> God says, no, I'm going to give you a son through Sarah. And you will call his name Isaac. Well, now there's something special about that name. Because when God said to him, this time I'm going to give you a son through Isaac, it says that Abraham laughed. Uh oh. <laughs> when God says something wrong, you do not laugh about his promises. And the name Isaac is the Hebrew word for laughter says, guess what you're going to name your son? Yeah. Um, you don't need to help God along with his promises. You don't need to help him figure things out, etc. If that's what Abraham thought he was doing, no. I don't know for sure. As I said, I don't know his thoughts. But it looks like that from the reading the scriptures. And of course, God did give him Isaac through Sarah, and all the blessings flow through Isaac and his descendants. Here, did Paul make up his own plan without God's help? I don't know. I'm not going to blame him, because I don't know. But I do know that God used all of the things that Paul had in mind and produced some terrific results out of it, but sure not the way Paul intended it. Paul didn't plan on spending four years in prison, getting beaten and all of that, and have all of those troubles that he went through. I'm sure that wasn't part of Paul's plan, but it was part of God's. And he used every bit of that. In fact, uh, while he was in that prison in Israel, he ends up preaching not only to the Roman procurator, but to the king and queen of the next country over, preaching to them about the Lord. And we have a perfect, such a nice little saying there. He's preaching to the king, and he asks the king, he says, don't you believe these things? You've already heard about them before. And the king says, almost you persuade me. Paul says, I wouldn't just want to almost, but persuade you to you be just like me, except not in prison. Of course, I paraphrase that a lot, but you understand the idea. He made the point to the Roman procurator, to this king and queen, 
along with a whole lot of prisoners that were in prison there, right along with him. God used him to reach a lot of people. The message of Christ still got proclaimed wherever Paul went, over and over and over. So, when therefore I have performed this, delivering the offering to Israel, and have sealed to them this route, I will come by you to Spain. I think he did. But not quite the way he had in mind. We know he got as far as Rome. We believe he got as far as Spain um, because of some of the uh, historical documents that are there. And all along the way, preaching and teaching the word. I like that. But as I said, this Roman church wasn't started by Paul. It was started by two other Christians who simply told everybody around them about the word of God, Priscilla and Aquila. Husband and wife group, and it seems like a, probably the wife did more of the talking because her name is usually listed first when it starts talking about the two. Um, nothing wrong with that. These two don't get much of any um, popularity or much of any, uh, people don't talk about them much. They did a tremendous work for the Lord. There's so many others like that in the scripture and in the world around us. Just simple Christian talking to other Christians or talking to other people and telling them about the Lord and doing a great job for the Lord day by day, just in their area, wherever they are, by being as much like Christ as they can be. Isn't that what he wants us to be? Just to live our daily lives wherever he puts us, whatever situation he puts us in, in a way that honors him, in a way that brings glory to Jesus by simply living your life by trying to be like him. That's our basic purpose as a Christian, is to be like Christ. Now, none of us do that perfectly. <laughs> none of us get all that close, but <laughs> that's our goal. When will we be just like him? Well, when we get up there. Here, we still got that human nature, still got all those temptations around us, and we fail. Yeah, each one of us. That's why I love all those promises about if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a wonderful promise. So when you and I do our best for the Lord and then do something stupid afterwards, <laughs> okay, so we do. We are human. He knows that. Um, he loves us anyway. I can't, Im can't imagine why he continues to love us as much and as long and as infinitely as he does. I mean, you'll probably hear me say that a hundred times if you stay here very long. But I don't know why he does, but I'm glad he does. And I just thank him for it. Day by day, as I look at my own, look back, you know how Satan loves to bring back to your mind things where you've messed up? Oh, yeah. They just and, and I think that what the reason is, is that Satan uses those to try and distract you from what you should be doing now. Instead, he gets you thinking about something where you messed up before and thinking about that and working hating that over in your mind and feeling sorry for yourself and for, for being a sinner. And we are. But if you've already asked God to have forgiven that sin, it's gone. What does he do with the sins that we ask him for forgiveness? Remember? So many different descriptions of it, but the whole idea is that he erases it. It's gone. It's never going to be held against us if we have sincerely asked him for forgiveness. So when Satan brings one of those things back to your mind, I guess you can just say, God already took care of that one. 
I don't need to worry about it. And if you're not sure if you'll ever ask forgiveness for it, do it. And then set it aside. But it, that's not easy. Satan loves to work on your mind and keep you occupied with things that are not helping with your daily situation, with what you're actually going through. So we need that help from the Lord, from his Holy Spirit, to keep our minds centered where they need to be. And I'm going to have to quit. How does that work? <laughs> okay. Um, anything more I should cover there? I love the fact that he closes this off like he's closing off his whole letter to them. And it's almost like he has a, he realizes, wait a minute, I didn't do all this other stuff. You ever do that when you're writing to somebody or when you're talking to somebody on the phone? <laughs> you say, start to hang up and you realize, oh, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's me and uh, probably all of us at some times. Well, that's what this next chapter is going to be about. He's got to say, oh, yeah, you need to mention this to somebody and this to somebody, and you need to just remember how much I love you guys and things like that. But we'll go through those later. Right now he says, pray for me. Notice something interesting there. Let's look at, I have, I'll take the time. <laughs> pray for me. Look in verse 30. Strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. In other words, he knows there's people there in Jerusalem that really hate him as a preacher of Christ. There were religious rulers that tried to have him executed a while back, <laughs> several years before. Um, all these people, he says, pray for me. The things will go well for me when I get there. Now, I just told you how things went when he got there. Not so good. <laughs> they went good as far as his delivering all that offering to the saints in Jerusalem that needed it. But then he went into the temple and got himself in trouble. Got himself arrested. Beaten. Whipped. Taken to uh, up to the next, to another town, Caesarea, where because... Um, well, that'll give you an idea of how, just how things were going. Um, he was in Jerusalem, imprisoned there. And the guards found out that there were some, I don't remember, it was 20 or 30, of the Jewish, uh, believe, not Christians, Jewish, strong Jewish believe, uh, religious people, who had gotten together and agreed that they were going to eat until they found a way to kill Paul. It's quite a commitment. And they had asked the uh, procurator to move Paul, to bring Paul out to the Sanhedrin to have a conference. The idea being that they were going to ambush him on the way. The Jews, the Roman authorities were warned about it ahead of time. And instead, that night, they took Paul up to Caesarea to a different prison. <laughs> they saved his life that way. But now he spent the rest of that two years imprisoned up in Caesarea, waiting to be put on trial. <laughs> so yeah, the people there in Jerusalem, the Jewish religious authorities, definitely did not like Paul. And he knew that he was walking in trouble. That's why he prayed, he asked them here to pray for him when he got there. And they did. And, of course, God saved his life there and kept on using him again and again and again until, well, many years later. But Paul, is Paul going to Rome? He says he is here. He's got all of his plans in place. And yes, he is going to end up in Rome. Not quite the way he planned. God has a way of modifying our plans but still accomplishing his purposes. He does that in your life. Don't get upset about it. 
His way is going to be better. You may not feel like it at the moment, but it's going to be better. I'm sure that Paul, well, he sat there for two years in a Jewish prison, wasn't so sure that this was better. <laughs> but he kept right on preaching to the people around him. Every one of the prisoners knew <laughs> what Paul was there for. And so did the jailers. All right, we're going to stop. I have, it's so easy when I'm talking about the Word of God to not want to stop. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Word. Thank you for your love for us, because that's where all of this comes from. But thank you for the way your Bible tells us about these things, for examples for us to learn from, to learn about how much you love us and how you work in us, even when we can't see what you're doing, even when we can't see your hand upon us. It's always there. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You never let us down. And I can't say from 1 Corinthians 15, the promise that you never give us anything too hard for us to handle with your help. But there's an important part of that verse that tells us that you always provide a way of escape. And that way of escape is calling on you, asking for your help. Lord, if we try to bull our way through some of these circumstances that we face using our human wisdom and our human strength, we're going to be in trouble. Help us to remember to ask you for wisdom, for guidance, for direction, and for patience. Because sometimes you, have, you just tell us to wait a while. Thank you that in all of these, your plans are always better than ours. Help us to remember that because it's awfully tough sometimes for us to accept the fact that what we think of isn't the best idea in the world. Thank you for being smarter than us and loving us enough to bring things about the way they should be. In Christ's name, amen. Jesus, only He brings salvation, full and free. There's a yearning in all our lives that only Jesus satisfies. I can't get it to work? No, it won't work. Alright. If you don't know the words, just close your eyes and enjoy it. Only Jesus God, for the time that we've had together as we've just gathered here, saying your praises and remembered what a wonderful God you are. Please now bless these folks as we go out of here. Guide and direct and help us so that we can be what you want us to be. Thank you for the potluck once that we're about to have. We ask your blessing upon that and all those who provided food and drink for us. We ask you just to make this a great time of fellowship too. In Jesus' name, amen.